Hello and welcome. I'm your host, Eudoria, and today we bring you the Matrix HSC Expert webinar to provide you with tips, advice, and expertise. This webinar will help you stay on track to maximize your HSC marks. Before we begin, let's meet today's HSC expert. Today, we'll be joined by Mr. Patrick Condliffe, English teacher at Matrix, with expert advice on how to maximize your marks in HSC English. For this webinar, we recommend you have a pen and paper on hand to jot down our tips. Now that you're ready, let's get into the webinar. Hi there, welcome to the Matrix webinars. My name is Pat Condliffe. I'm an English teacher here at Matrix and I've been helping students achieve their academic goals for the past 10 years. In that time, I've seen how students who achieve top rank study and how those who fall short of their hopes and expectations study. In this webinar, I will share with you study practices and habits that distinguish the high achievers from other students. Students generally have seven different areas of weakness. Knowledge, you have to know the content being assessed. This means the content and texts for the common module, module A and module B. So at least four, if not five texts. English comprehension skills, you need to be able to respond to a paper one, section one, short response section. You must be able to read and comprehend and respond to a variety of short, challenging texts and questions. Often this is a student's first encounter with the short answer section. Writing skills. You need to be able to write clearly and concisely while responding to the questions. Essay skills. You need to be able to plan, structure and write a well-structured essay while under the pump. You need Mod C writing skills. That means to be able to write and potentially reflect on a creative, discursive, or persuasive piece to a stimulus. Each of these genres is a different style with sharply different requirements to the others. Exam skills. Managing time and stress and utilizing time for planning and strategizing is a skill most students overlook. Time management, the essential one. You've got to be able to complete the exam in the time set. Now, I'm gonna discuss the strategies and processes that will help you approve across these seven different areas today so you can nail your trials when they come up. Study habits and avoiding shortcuts. But before we get into these seven things, we need to address the dirty secret of English study. Most students say they're doing it consistently, but they don't actually do it. That's if they're studying English at all and not kicking the can down the road further. Don't worry. Those of you watching that fit into these two categories aren't gonna be alone. I consistently encounter students in your boat throughout the year. Helping them turn their English marks and HSC potential around is actually the most rewarding part of my job as a teacher. But, soppy sentiments aside, if you are in that boat, you do need to change your study habits. Today, now, or you're gonna do significant damage to your ATAR and HSC results. So, how do you build study habits now? Well, first you have to commit to it. Agree with yourself that this is something that you're gonna do on an ongoing basis and that you'll stick with it. For a lot of people, that will be daunting, but a good habit is to mentally break things up into bite-sized chunks. Endurance runners, cyclists, break things up to endure their challenging sports. They might break things into 10 or 30 second chunks they count through or fixate on a distance marker to make it to the next one and then the next one. So too do people trying to establish new healthy lifestyle habits. They take them day by day. A good way to think about it is trying to read a chunky book. That 350 page book may look daunting at first sight, but if you keep a bookmark and read in two sessions a day of say 20 pages, you'll see that bookmark travel down that book in about a week. It's the same if you wanna establish new productive study habits. So how do you do this? Well, tell yourself that you have to main this habit for one day and then a week and then the next. Next, you have to finish the month. What if you miss a day? So maybe you do mess up and miss a day. Life gets in the way. That's fine. The trick then is to start again and make sure you stick to the plan the next day and the next. It's the consistency that builds the habits over time. If you want to learn more about this, you should read James Clear's Atomic Habits or check out his website. I've included the link below. The first step in achieving this change is producing a weekly rhythm. What's a weekly rhythm, I hear you ask? It's a timetable of sorts, a list of practices, activities, and things you need to do on a regular weekly basis. 
It should be allocated by day and time and should address the times that you are not at school. If you want to help producing one, you should read our article, How to Create a Weekly Study Rhythm. It will provide you with a step-by-step -step process for building a study rhythm. There's also a free template you can download to save time when you want to implement one. But briefly, what you want to do is, first, estimate how much free time you have on a weekly basis, decide how much time you will need to allocate to each subject, weigh up your strengths and weaknesses for each subject to do this, and then, next, assign tasks to be completed on each day on a weekly basis. Within each subject, you want to balance the different needs or skills that you need to build consistently. Use it and stick to it. Because there are only so many hours in a day and so many days in a week, you need to prioritize working on weaknesses over strengths. However, you don't want to leave your stronger areas unsupported. So how do you figure out your strengths and weaknesses? You'll want to test yourself. To figure out which areas need the most work, do a practice trial paper. Take it timed as if it were the real thing. This will give you an accurate sense of where you are really at. It may help you to do it with some mates. Our senior English tutor, Edward Zhao, recommends doing all mock exams with some friends. He says it's great practice for the real thing as it simulates an exam hall environment where you're sitting your English exam with the rest of your cohort. And this is good because getting used to the background noise of rustling papers, copying, pen scrawling, and frustrated sighs is an effective way of building focus. So do paper one on one day, and then paper two on another. If you're looking for past papers, there are past HSC papers on the NISA website, or there are other web websites where students share their school's past papers. Although sometimes these are covered by copyright and may get taken down from time to time. Once you've set the two papers, get some feedback on them. Matrix English students get the opportunity for regular feedback from their English teachers and tutors. But if you're not enrolled in Matrix for English, you could ask your school English teacher to mark them and highlight your strengths or weaknesses. Or take the initiative, mark them yourself against the marking criteria for the HSC, which can be found on the NISA website. I've included a link to NISA's past papers and their marking resources below. Now you know what you're struggling with, you want to prioritize things. For example, if you struggle with supporting your arguments with quotations, or finishing the exams in the time limit, then clearly you need to revisit your text and take some more detailed notes, and then practice writing timed responses. In your weekly rhythm, this may play out as nightly reading of the module texts and taking notes, and then writing two practice responses on the weekend, under timed conditions. Now that we've looked at what a weekly rhythm is and how you can go about developing one, Let's dig into solving those seven issues that English students struggle with in their trials. We'll begin with text and module knowledge. At the end of the day, if you don't know your text, you can't talk about it. It's quite simple. You may think you can get away with talking about stuff you don't know, but your markers and teachers, they've seen it before, they've heard it before, Therefore, the first thing you must ensure is that you know your text for common module, module A, and module B, and know them backwards. Ideally, for trials, this means rereading all of your texts in their entirety. But perhaps you're time poor, and maybe you lack the time to complete this. If that's the case, you'll need to identify specific weaknesses or gaps in your knowledge. What does this involve? Well, this is, means ensuring that you have a holistic understanding of the texts. How can you assess this? Get a friend you're studying English with. Have them quiz you and see if you can do the following. Identify the key events in the text. Identify the key ideas, themes, or contextual concerns present in each of these key events. Support each theme or idea for each key event with at least one example. Ideally, you'd be able to identify two. Identify the technique in each example, and then try and explain how does it create meaning? And then finally, explain how it relates to the module of study. If you struggle to complete this, then you don't know things and you must revise your knowledge of the texts first. So start by rereading or rewatching it. And as you read, identify each key event and take down some handwritten notes around the event. You want to note what occurs and who it involves, where in the novel the event occurs, what ideas, themes, or concerns are presented in that key moment of the text, 
write down the best two or three examples that convey these ideas for that moment, present a description of the technique and its effect, and try and explain how it relates to the module. I would personally recommend using a table for these notes, ideally one that's handwritten, and it might look like this. If you can find that you can recall some quotes, but are at a loss about how to use them in an essay, you should take the time to expand your notes. Return to any notes that you have taken, and then expand on the sections where you discuss technique and how that technique generates meaning. It's also important that you revisit the modules and their outlines. Most questions asked in HSC and trial HSC papers use parts of the module descriptions. For example, the 2021 common module question was, analyze how your prescribed text represents the ways individuals respond to the challenges they face. And the common module rubric states that, in this common module, students deepen their understanding of how texts represent individual and collective human experiences they examine how texts represent human qualities and emotions associated with or arising from these experiences. Clearly, the above question is addressing the individual and collective human experiences and the human qualities and emotions arising from these experiences. If you've analyzed your set text with an eye to the module concerns as I've outlined, then you should have plenty of examples and ideas for how to respond to this. Another example is looking at the module A question from 2020. In textual conversations, the latter text is often seen as a shadow, lacking the originality and power of the earlier. To what extent is this statement true of the prescribed text you have studied in module A? This question asks you to make a judgment about the value of one text in relation to the other. The question addresses two parts of the module A rubric. First, in this module, students explore the ways in which the comparative study of texts can reveal resonances and dissonances between and within texts. Students consider the ways that a reimagining or reframing of an aspect of a text might mirror, align, or collide with the details of another text. Students need to think about how the resonances and dissonances between texts add to or detracts from its value. Further, they should consider whether a text that aligns or significantly mirrors an earlier text ideas can be said to stand on its own. And secondly, Nisa says that as students engage with the texts, they consider how their understanding, appreciation, and enjoyment of both texts has been enhanced through the comparative study and how the personal, social, cultural, and historical contextual knowledge that they bring to the texts influences their perspectives. Here you're being asked to consider how your knowledge of the two texts and their context has shaped your understanding of them and the value you assign to them. Perhaps your close study has revealed to you that Ted Hughes's poems, while having artistic merit on their own, are hollow imitations of class confessional works. Or maybe you feel that Margaret Atwood's adaptation of Shakespeare's muddled and boring Tempest give it a vigor and focus that was lacking, allowing it to have its own personality. Regardless, to make such a value judgment, you need to have a thorough knowledge of the text in the module. If you feel you know the text but not the module, here are a couple of solutions I've found that have helped students. First, write a summary of your text. For each key event or structural feature, make a detailed note about how it reflects the concerns of the module. What would that look like? Perhaps it looks like this. Revisit your notes and add an additional column or section to them. For each example, make notes for how the example reflects the rubric. That might look like this. The important takeaway from this discussion is that you have to know your texts. Those students that consistently achieve band six, they know their texts backwards. The first step in improving your trial English marks and thereby your internal rank is ensuring that you know yours. You cannot write a successful essay response without the examples and analysis, and that is only possible from knowing the texts. This is one of the reasons why revising prescribed texts and building detailed and accessible notes is such a key component of our English trial preparation course. But what happens when you don't get to see the text before the exam? I get asked this a lot, and it's a fair question. Section one of paper one is challenging as it's not something that many schools spend significant time on. Many students lack consistent comprehension practice. Teachers don't have the time to prioritize it in class while trying to cover the material from the prescribed text and preparing students for assessments. 
So let's have a look at this now. Paper 1, Section 1 is asking students to analyze unseen texts and provide a series of concise and insightful structured responses to questions about the texts and the common module rubric. The short answer section is asking you to demonstrate a particular set of skills to the clock. These skills are managing time pressure, reading quickly, reading for information to a question, identifying techniques and meaning against the clock, formulating an argument quickly, writing concisely, and producing structured responses under pressure. Unfortunately, many students are expected to just have these skills, as if they appear from nowhere. Having taught the HSC preparation and trial HSC preparation courses here at Matrix for a number of years, I have been consistently told that students don't practice these skills in class at school. Or if they do, it's merely a practice paper before an in-class assessment. And that's the only practice they have before the trials or the HSC. This is unfortunate given that the unseen section of the HSC is worth 10% of the English marks for a student's ATAR. This means that students need to practice these skills largely on their own. So with that in mind, let me give you some proven methods for this that the Matrix English students learn in the classroom. A Year 12 common module course is geared towards short answer responses. In most lessons, students look at a question and short passage, then follow the steps for analyzing it in response to the question. Students are given a set amount of time to read it and make their initial observations about it. We'll then look at a model response and look at what it makes to, to score highly. We'll then give the students a time limit and have them produce a response before marketing, marking it and providing feedback and doing some peer review work. This process consistently improves students' confidence and results with short answer questions. And in the trial prep course, we do an intensive version of this, where we spend the first day blitzing short answer questions and doing section one of paper one. So how can you do this at home and how is it going to help you? Well, first, get into the habit of reading short passages and articles and poems. Read a poem or a short passage of nonfiction or prose or a short story of no more than 1500 words each day to the clock. Set a timer for five minutes and read the piece and aim to identify as many techniques as you can as you read. Write them down as you go. If you're not sure of techniques, brush up on your knowledge of them. The Matrix website has an excellent set of literary and poetic technique lists with clear examples and explanations. I've included the link below. Why do this? Well, this will help you develop your reading and analytical skills. You'll gain the confidence and skill in reading quickly for relevant information. If you want to step it up, get your hands on past papers. Pick a question and related text or text and set yourself a five or 10 minute timer for reading. Five minutes if a single text or 10 if it's a pair of text. Read the question and then read the text, keeping an eye out for techniques and information relevant to the question then assign two minutes for each mark available for the question. For example, a five mark question should only take 10 minutes. Set your timer and then write a response to the question. Doing this will help you practice writing responses to unseen texts while under time pressure. Additionally, doing this with individual questions to begin with will develop your skills and confidence before you move on to a whole section in 55 minutes. 10 minutes reading time, 45 minutes writing time. What should you do with your responses? Well, if you've done a past HSC paper, there's a marking criteria you can mark them against to see how you performed. If you've managed to get your hands on a past trial paper from a school, there may not be an accompanying marking rubric, in which case you should ask your school teacher, matrix tutor, or matrix teacher to give you some feedback and a mark on your response. If you don't have access to those, then you can seek out some peer feedback. Nice's sample paper one provides some sample marking rubrics that you can use to design your own for trial papers that don't have a rubric. Gaining feedback on your responses will help you see what you need to keep doing more of and what you need to do less of. Initially, you'll likely find that struggle to, you struggle to write enough in the time limit. Part of this will be unfamiliarity with the questions and part will be struggling to identify techniques and formulate written arguments under pressure. As you practice more, you may find that you struggle to finish responses because you can't get out what you want to say. Most often this is because students aren't being concise with their responses. But how do you combat this? How do you become uh, a master of erudition? Well, start editing your responses after you've marked them. 
At their most basic, short answer sections are demanding you provide key pieces of information about a topic in sentence form. You're not being marked on the elegance of your expression or capacity for exuberant diction. The rubric is strictly asking for grammatically correct responses to the questions asked. Only some of the higher mark English advanced short answer questions have a component for language. In addition, the amount required for full marks can be deceptively short. In the 2020 paper, the sample six mark response from NISA was only 178 words long. With this in mind, get into the habit of going over your short responses, especially the ones where you've not finished the response and remove any extraneous expressions and words. Look for passive constructions that could have been active. That is, avoid saying the ball was chased by the dog when you could say the dog chased the ball. Strike out unnecessary adverbs and adjectives. Find sentences that provide information that's not relevant to the question and cross them out. The more you practice this, the more you'll start thinking about omitting these when you write. You'll develop the habits of writing more concisely. The more you do this, read unseen and analyze unseen texts, attempt short answer questions and pass paper questions on short answers to the clock and review and edit your responses, the faster, more concise and erudite you'll become. A good way of ensuring that you get this practice is putting time aside a few times a week in your weekly rhythm. For example, you might assign 20 minutes three times a week to reading and attempting short answer questions. Then once a week or fortnight, attempt a whole section one from paper one. If you're looking for text to use for practice, we've included some links below to get you started. All right, let's get stuck into building your writing skills now. But I can't get good at section one because my writing is poor to begin with, you might say. You won't be alone. A lot of students struggle with writing. Some struggle with concision, others are unsure of correct grammar or have poor spelling. Fear not though, these are trainable skills. What many students forget is that writing is a skill and not an innate trait. People aren't born writers. They become good or better writers through continuous writing. The more one writes, the more effective their writing will become. Writing concisely and correctly is an important skill and will help your marks. It's actually more time consuming for markers to read poorly written sentences. You need to reread them and try and make sense of it before you can move on to the next sentence and that's before you provide feedback. You see, markers are time poor, just like you, the student sitting exams. The less a marker spends trying to make sense of your sentences, the more they can focus on what you're saying and arguing. This will make your marker's job easier and raise your marks by presenting more accessible insights and arguments. So how do you become a better writer? You practice writing. A good, simple exercise is to pick a topic, any topic, and write about it for 10 minutes. Write by hand. This will help with your writing speed in exams. Then, once you've finished it, edit it. Read it aloud and find all the sections that sound strange or wrong and mark them up. See if you can spot the missing or misplaced punctuation by listening for when you stumble or have to reread sections. We naturally learn grammar by speaking and listening to it. It's often only when we hear a piece of writing or read it aloud that we start spotting mistakes. As a professional writer and editor, I'll always try to read work aloud so I can hear what it sounds like, to hear if the sentence works. Then, once you've done that, type it up or rewrite it. Often when we rewrite things, we start seeing how we can improve them. We start strengthening arguments and removing unnecessary sentences and clauses. You can also use tools to help you improve some of your weaknesses. Grammarly is a useful tool for identifying grammatical and spelling errors in your writing. But if you're going to use it, turn off the autocorrect function and take the time to read the reason your sentences have been marked as errors to learn how to avoid them. And then there are online editors and apps like the Hemingway app, named after the master of brevity, Ernest Hemingway. You can use it to wake your, make your writing punchier and more concise. It grades the difficulty of your writing and it will highlight your piece in different colors to illustrate how you can improve it. Using tools like these the right way will teach you the right sort of writing habits for concise and readable expression. This is exactly what you want to engage and wow your markers. If you want a book to help you with this, or two, I recommend The Elements of Style by Strunk and White. Uh, or similarly, William Zinzer's On Writing Well is also an excellent engaging guide to writing nonfiction. Once you've got your reading analysis and writing skills in order, you're ready to tackle getting your essays in shape. Four, essay skills. The most common question I'm asked by students is, 
If I write a generic essay, can you help me refine it so it works for any question? I can completely understand where this idea comes from. English is time consuming and often amorphous and vague. Students want a shortcut for English, not to cheat it, but to save time. Generic essays seem like a viable candidate. After all, they were commonplace in the pre-2019 HSC for English. Many students today have older siblings who sat the HSC then, memorized a generic essay and scored a band six, but those were simpler times, much less challenging and focused questions presented to students. Generic essays are a great idea, but they don't work in practice. A question like 2021's Module A question, where a pair of extracts are provided and you are asked to discuss how the extracts provided contribute to a broader textual conversation between the pair of prescribed texts that you have studied in Module A, is designed to thwart generic responses. A generic essay is not going to address the specific ideas and themes the extracts are steering you towards. If the essay you're relying on is concerned with other ideas, you're in trouble, and chances are it would be. Similarly, 2020's Mod B question presents you with an extended extract of the prescribed text and asks you, in what ways does this excerpt reflect the concerns and aesthetic qualities of so-and-so's novel? This question is specifically asking you to discuss the ideas and structure and genre of the set text. If you have a generic response focused on a particular set of themes, then once again, you're in trouble. So if you can't rely on a generic essay, what can you do? Well, while there's no silver bullet, there are some practices you can follow that will help you tackle these challenging and specific questions. Let's look at them. The Lego technique. I call this one the Lego technique because it reminds me of playing with Lego. Some students have referred to it as the Tetris technique after I've taught them for the same reason. It goes something like this. Remember the pieces of analysis we discussed in the first part of this webinar? Way, way, way back when, when I was berating you for not knowing your texts? Yeah, this. Yes, this is where that comes in handy. Okay, the point of making those notes was that you have chunks of information, an example, a technique, an explanation of what it is doing in terms of creating meaning or reflecting the module. This is like a Lego piece. On its own, it's not amazing. However, it does attach nicely to other pieces of evidence and argumentation, like Lego. Now, if you've done what I suggested, you would have a library of these chappies, all ready to slot together. If you know your text and module well, you'll know that some of these pieces are going to work well with other pieces. Much like you don't want to mix up the wrong wheels in a Lego build, so too you don't want to mix up the examples or themes or examples in your essay. By having a bank of these examples and statements that you've practiced writing about these things, then the easier it will be to click these together to build your essay. Like a generic essay, it's kind of pre-constructed, but unlike a generic essay, it's tailored to the questions. Now, you may be thinking, how am I gonna memorize all of those quotations for all of the prescribed texts? Well, there's a couple of solutions for that that we work through with Matrix students in our HSE and trial prep courses. They start with practice papers. Practice papers, I can hear you groaning through the screen. Sorry, they're unavoidable, but they are the best way to get better at writing essays under time pressure. Remember, writing is a skill and not an innate trait. You get better at exam papers by doing exam papers. Don't worry, there is a practice hack of sorts. But first, let's look at what you should be doing with practice essay papers to prepare for your trials. When writing practice essays, there are some things you should do to make it more effective. First, start working towards progressively tighter time limits. For example, in the common module, you have 45 minutes to write your section two essay. So when you're writing the first practice essay, give yourself five minutes reading time and an hour to write. Plenty of time to get it done and done well. For your second, make that five minute reading time and 55 minutes writing time. Then the next, drop by five minutes again. You wanna to aim to be able to write your section two essay in 40 minutes or less to the same quality or better of your initial 60 minute slow and steady essays. Similarly, for the paper two essays, you wanna start at say 55 minutes and work down to 35 minutes. Why? Well, first, the challenge of writing to the clock progressively will improve your information recall. Second, it will help you learn to manage pressure. And third, you'll gain confidence knowing that you can complete the essay with time to spare. Five minutes can be quite a lot in an exam. And then you can revisit your work to proof it or invest it in another section, like that hard mod B essay or the unfinished short response question in section one. 
Fourth, it will help you rote learn information and learn to apply the Lego method we just looked at. But you're gonna be pressed for time sometimes. So how can you practice some of these skills fast and develop your essay writing? Scaffolding drills. This is another task I do with my students in the trial prep course and common module course. If you're time poor, scaffolding drills are a great way to think on your feet and get some essay practice in, in under 10 minutes. So what's a scaffolding drill? Essentially, you wanna fashion the outline of an essay, its thesis, statement, topic sentences, and conclusion with suggestions for quotations in under 10 minutes. Ideally, you wanna see if you can get it down to five minutes, but more on that later. So what do you do? Take an essay question and set a timer for 10 minutes. Then fashion your essay scaffold following five simple steps. One, unpack the question. Two, draft a thesis statement. Three, draft two to four topic sentences. Four, draft your conclusion. And five, outline as many quotations to support your topic sentences as you have time for. It'll be challenging at first, but as you get used to them, you'll be able to produce more in-depth scaffolds. Why is this important? Well, you want to practice thinking under the pump. Additionally, you want to establish the habit of planning your essays and exams. The five minutes you spend planning an essay in an exam is time saved struggling with writer's block or trying to write yourself out of the corner that you wrote yourself into because you weren't writing to a plan. Finally, it's an excellent opportunity for you to test your knowledge quickly and efficiently of your prescribed texts and their content. In addition, if you have prepared some good notes and have started applying the Lego method, when you're doing a scaffold drill, you'll not just be recalling quotations, but those whole blocks of analysis. If you're too time poor to do an essay every day, you can at least do one or two scaffolding drills. It's these kinds of marginal gains that help top matrix students score highly while others wallow behind. If you wanna know more about scaffolding drills, check out the blog article and YouTube video we have on them already. The link is below. If you're struggling with how to scaffold different types of essays, check out our articles on essay writing to learn the tips that Matrix English students learn to use in the classroom. So when should you try these? What about in a study group? Why, that's a fabulous idea. Let's look at why writing in a study group will boost your trial performance. Studying alone can sometimes feel more productive, but studying in a group exposes you to feedback. This is especially true for exercises like writing practice essays or doing scaffolding drills or answering short answer questions. But you gotta be careful because study groups can easily morph into social events. So to keep a lid on things, when you meet up, it's helpful to set some rules around how much time you have to spend working, maybe not having devices to distract everyone turned on, working to the clock and cross-marking each other's responses. Meeting up with some study mates and doing things together, like my colleague Edward suggested, is going to be good for a couple of reasons. One, you'll get used to the sounds of distraction that come from an exam hall. Two, there's an element of confidence from doing things in a group. Three, you'll be more motivated to work as your peers are also working. Four, you have a group who you can peer mark with. This last point is really useful. Having peers assess your work and vice versa exposes you to different ideas and lets you see how others respond to your work and ideas. Such exposure will be a powerful ace up your sleeve if you get a challenging question or the trials of the HSC, because that's when Martha's odd idea about Richard III is gonna be a great idea for your response to that tricky mod A question. But not everything in your trials is gonna be short answers and literary essays. There's potentially mod C to contend with. So let's brush up on our mod C writing skills. Mod C is a challenging beast because it requires such disparate skills. Discursive writing, persuasive writing, creative writing, reflective writing. Not only that, you potentially need to respond to an instruction or a stimulus prompt. Yes, not only do you need to be creative, you need to respond to a prompt. The horror! Now, I wish I could tell you not to worry and to only practice one genre of writing, but the fact is that you can be asked for any of the above. For example, the 2020 paper two mod C question asked students specifically for a piece of imaginative writing. Not discursive, not persuasive, imaginative. The 2021 question required a prose piece and a reflection. So if they can mix it up with specific requirements in the HSE, you can be sure that a trial paper can do the same. 
So what can you do to prepare for these? Let's have a look. Timed practice. Timed practice is gonna be the biggest part of your preparation for Mod C in the trials. And later the HSC. You wanna set aside time each week or at the very least once a fortnight to write a Mod C piece. Aim for writing a relatively complete piece in 35 minutes. Mix up your practice. Don't just focus on discursive or creative questions. Attack persuasive ones too. There's nothing stopping Nisa asking you to write a persuasive piece. They asked for a creative in 2019 worth 20 marks. Your cohort for trials or the HSE may be the first to get it set a 20 mark persuasive piece. And don't just practice writing a piece for 35 minutes. Undertake some tasks where you have a com composite task, a piece of writing plus a reflection. Give yourself 20 minutes to write a discursive, persuasive or creative piece and 15 minutes to write a reflection. This way, you're prepared for all eventualities. If you're looking for some Mod C practice questions, we've got 20 craft of writing practice questions to get you Mod C ready on our blog that we've shared the links in below. Now, in many of our Matrix Creative Writing courses, we promote free writing. Free writing is a process developed by writer and academic Peter Elbow to help him overcome writer's block and improve his writing skills. And it has since become a mainstay of professional writing courses at places like Harvard, Stanford, or the prestigious Iowa Writers Workshop. The principle is simple. Set a timer for five or 10 minutes and just write. Write about whatever you fancy. Maybe you'll start a story or rewrite a scene from a text or perhaps start an essay or paragraph from an essay. The topic doesn't really matter as long as you write. Don't edit, don't stop, don't go back and change things. Just write. Why do this? On its own, doing it just once, it's probably not gonna make you a better writer but doing it consistently is going to improve your writing for a few reasons. First, it helps get past writer's block and gets you into a habit of writing on demand. Second, it will help you generate ideas, critical or creative writing, and not censor them. And thirdly, it will help improve your writing stamina. Once the timer finishes, either stop, or if you're in a roll, keep going. When you're finished, have a read through it. Maybe you'll find some great ideas you can use in a Mod C task or an essay on one of your prescribed texts. If you do find a good idea or a powerful turn of phrase, make a note of it and come back to it later. That way you can incorporate it into your next writing practice. So when should you free write? Ideally, you should set aside some time for it most days. Usually I'd recommend using it as a warm up before starting a practice essay or creative piece. Personally, I'll spend five to 10 minutes doing it when I have to write large chunks of copy, like scripting a presentation like this or before starting work on an article for a client. If you're super time poor and can't schedule 10 minutes a day, schedule five minutes before your, you start your English writing practice. In addition, to try and settle your nerves on exam day, consider free writing for five or 10 minutes on the morning of the exam to clear out your jitters before you go into the hall. I've had many students tell me that it calms their nerves to sit and write freely for a bit before they have to go into the exam room. It's certainly going to be a good habit to get into before writing a practice creative or discursive piece. Speaking of which, let's look at some trial tips for discursive writing. Obviously, discursive writing isn't going to emerge out of a vacuum. It's going to require two things from you, practice and research. Practice so you have confidence writing in a discursive style and structure, and research so you know what you're talking about. Now, we've already touched on timed practice, so here I want to look at research and reading and a 10-minute perspective drill. Research and regular wide reading, these two can be done at the same time. Reading widely, especially articles in a mix of persuasive and discursive essays, will improve your writing skills by exposing you to different styles that you may want to imitate. Yes, it's fine to adopt and imitate the styles of other writers. That's the point of Mod C. Reading widely will give you exposure to a variety of topics that you may wish to explore in your Mod C writing, persuasive, creative, or discursive. When reading, keep a notebook handy. If you find a good idea, useful quotation, technique, stat, or data point, or maybe a structure and style, make note of it and experiment with it in your own writing. If you're trying to find pieces to read, Matrix students get access to a wide library of discursive texts in my.matrix, but you can also find good short pieces on sites like Aeon, The Atlantic, Quadrant, Mianjin, Kill Your Darlings, The New Yorker, or even Medium. Make sure you set aside a couple of blocks each week in your study rhythm for reading. Maybe it's 30 minutes on the train on the way to or from school. Perhaps it's 20 minutes in bed instead of watching a video on YouTube. 
presenting two perspectives. If you're time poor and lack the time to write a full discursive piece, you can practice short exercises. Rather than writing a full piece or scaffold, do something different and get comfortable providing different perspectives. To do this, pick a topic, set a 10 minute timer and write about the topic from two different perspectives. The task is to discuss each perspective objectively while employing literary and rhetorical devices. Once you're finished, set it aside for a while, an hour or so, and come back to it and read over it. Correct it for grammar and spelling and see if you can make it more concise. Consider where you can embellish it with more techniques or to enhance style or voice. Persuasive writing. Persuasive writing is often overlooked by students and teachers. Yet it's an area of writing that you should know and will most likely need and use later in life when writing that cover letter for a job or application or pay rise or proposal. Obviously, persuasive writing requires techniques, so you want to brush up on those. Matrix English students get lists of English techniques in the back of their theory books. We've also an extensive list of techniques in our literary techniques toolkits on our blog. The link again is below. But beyond that, what can you do to improve confidence and skill in persuasive writing? Let's look at some exercises. Play at being manipulative and polemical by practicing pathos. Students are largely told to avoid being subjective in their critical writing. You're advised to limit your use of personal pronouns and to avoid using techniques in your critical writing or being too attacking or polemical. Mod C persuasive writing is your opportunity to toss those rules out of the window and be a bit more entertaining or even malevolent. You can and should have fun with this. Aristotle argued thousands of years ago that persuasive writing and rhetoric, rhetoric is most effective if it balances the three pillars of rhetoric. Ethos, your standing. Logos, the logic of your argumentation. And pathos, the emotion of the argument. As high schoolers, you have mostly been limited to logos and to a lesser extent, ethos. For module C persuasive writing, you want to practice dialing up the pathos, the emotion of your argument. After all, for good or ill, emotional debate is often persuasive. So what can you do to practice this? Pick a topic and then pick a side on this topic. For example, if the topic is, what's the best brand of sneaker, Adidas or Nike, you will need to figure out which brand you will advocate for or against. Once you've made your choice, give yourself 10 minutes to write a paragraph extolling the virtues of your sneaker of choice while dissing the lesser of the two. Now, the purpose of this is to practice pathos. So you must ensure that you use as many techniques as you can to rile up your readers. This means unleashing satire, rhetorical questions, chiasmus, anecdotes, and metaphors. Unsure of what these are? Check out our blog or the resources in my.matrix. And then when you're finished, give your piece to a teacher, tutor, or peer for some feedback. Another exercise you can engage in to improve your persuasive writing beyond practicing persuasive essays and past papers is engaging in a written debate with mates. To do this, pick a topic that's not gonna to lead to all out conflict, pick something benign like which is superior, coffee or bubble tea, and take opposing sides. Then set yourself a timer for five to 10 minutes. Next, write a short three to four sentence or one paragraph argument supporting your position, using persuasive devices as you go. Then exchange arguments. Give yourself a couple of minutes to read and digest each other's, and then set another five minute timer and write a rebuttal to the other's argument. Try to take things point by point, and yes, remember to incorporate persuasive devices. Finally, do one last round where you rebut the new arguments and sum summarize your arguments. What you've done in this exercise is sketch out a persuasive argument while refuting counter arguments, a key skill for rhetoric and persuasive writing. You've also exposed yourself to another's writing and argumentation that you can borrow from. You don't need to limit this to just two of you. You could just as easily pick topics that aren't just binary and involve three or four people. What about creative writing? Obviously, the days of nurturing a generic creative and getting it to work for the stimulus are gone. Instead, you need to be prepared to either write an original piece to a particular theme and incorporate a particular technique, or rewrite a moment from a text that you've studied employing a particular style or technique. So aside from practicing past papers and trial papers, what else can you do? Improving your creative writing requires two things, practicing your use of techniques and being creative. You may think you're not creative, but trust me, 
You are. If you can apply maths to solve an extension two question or economic theory to write an eco essay, you're applying theory in a creative manner. This is using creativity. Using creativity is just a learnt skill like any other. In our creative writing and mod C course, Dr. Trish May, English coordinator extraordinaire, has a plethora of exercises for building creative skills such as describing the room belonging to a character or describing the inner thoughts of a person you spot on the train. So what else can you do at home? Well, here are two exercises that you can squeeze into your weekly rhythm to ensure that you gain confidence and competence, fan fiction and flash fiction. Fan fiction is a fun one we like to do in our Mod C courses, but we also like to advocate to students during our trial and HSE prep courses too. Mod C, after all, is about learning through imitation. So you can do drills where you write short scenes involving your favorite characters from film, literature, or TV. What do I mean? Well, perhaps you feel that Snape and Harry really needed to sit down over a couple of pints of butter beer and discuss their problems. Don't leave it to the imagination. Sit down and write it. Writing fan fiction is a way many famous authors started their careers. J.K. Rowling wrote Arthurian Legend fanfic. Neil Gaiman started off writing Doctor Who, Sherlock Holmes, and The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy fanfic. So if this sounds like your jam, try to set aside a 20 to 30 minute block once or twice a week to write the scenes in your favorite properties that should have happened, but didn't as they should have happened. Flash fiction is a type of writing characterized by its brevity. Flash fiction is often considered to be less than 500 words, although sometimes is categorized as less than 1500 words, and sometimes as few as six. Writing flash fiction is a great way to hone your writing skills in a brief period of time. The beauty of flash fiction is that it forces you to boil your ideas down to key things. Maybe it's the fundamental parts of a couple's relationship, or maybe it's the briefest moment in a story. Writing shorter flash fiction is a great way to hone your Mod C trial exam skills, and again, is something we get students to do in our creative writing classes. So what should you do? Set a word limit and timer. Maybe it's 10 minutes and 150 to 200 words. Then try and write an entire moment from a story or pen a character portrait. These exercises are great for forcing you to focus on concision and limit the breadth of your storytelling. One of the biggest struggles that students tell me of is of struggling to tell their story they've got in their imaginations for a mod C task. What they don't realize is they only need to tell a moment or a fragment of it. This is an excellent way to hone that skill. Dr. Trish has many more writing hacks and fun skill exercises that will make you a better writer in her Mod C course. Once you've written your persuasive, discursive, or creative piece, you may need to complement it with a reflective piece. So what's reflective writing? Reflective writing is the final aspect of Mod C you have to be confident with. Reflective tasks ask you to explain and demonstrate what you set out to achieve with a piece of writing. I won't dwell on it too much as it's fairly self-explanatory. We do have some good resources on the blog to help you with reflective tasks. We've put the links below. But there are three things that you must do if you get a Mod C question with a reflective component. First, employ structure. Don't just spit out a paragraph or a wall of texts. Write something that has an introduction stating what you wish to achieve. Then a body paragraph explaining how you set out to do this, including examples from the piece of work you were inspired by and your own piece of work. And finally, a conclusion explaining what you took away from this experience and whether you felt successful. Secondly, you want to provide examples. You must provide examples for Mod C reflective pieces. This is something many students neglect, yet NISA has discussed in their Marking Center feedback on numerous occasions. This means provide an example from the text you've been inspired by or trying to imitate, then explain how it creates meaning, then explain how you tried to imitate or were inspired by this use of technique. Then discuss an example from your own piece and then explore how you feel it creates meaning. This is an important habit to get into. Remember, if you want more details on this, read our popular article on reflective writing that we've linked in the blog. And if you're a Matrix English student struggling with this, don't forget to book a workshop. Finally, I'd like to provide a few pieces of advice regarding preparing for exams and coping with exam stress. Most of the problems students raise with me about exam skills are about time. The big three are stress management, students being stressed out by the enormity of the exams and the time pressures implicit in them, coping with writer's block, 
anxiety making it harder to get started and they know that the clock is ticking and then running out of time. So let's have a quick look at some things we found to help students in these situations. Stress and anxiety are horrible things and all too common. Don't be ashamed. Almost everyone will face these in year 12. Instead, what you want to do is practice some coping methods in case this is something that affects you. We have a blog article on stress management that I've included in the links below. But here are some handy tips if you feel that rising dread and anxiety. Breathe. Maintaining regular breathing and breath control helps to regulate your heart. If you feel things are getting a bit much, breathe. Close your eyes and focus on your breathing. Count to 10, breathe out for a slow five count, and then breathe in gently for a five count. Repeat this five or six times. You can also plan. Writing a plan for questions will get you something to focus on. It's great because it makes a daunting exam a series of bite-sized chunks. When we break large tasks into small tasks, like studying English, as I discussed way back at the start, we make them accessible and conquerable. But what happens if you get so stressed you forget what to write? Dealing with writer's block is a real thing, and it can strike at any time. The first port of call if suffering from writer's block should be breathing exercises. Close your eyes and put your pen down. Focus on calming and controlling your breathing and just focusing on your breath for a minute or two. More often than not, this will help you calm and refocus. If that isn't effective, two things that will also help with it are planning and refocusing your attention. The more you stress about writer's block, the more anxious you'll get. So if you can, map out a quick and rough plan for the question causing you grief and move on to another question and then come back to it. This will alleviate the stress and help you refocus. Often you'll be coming up with solutions in the back of your mind while writing a different response. If that doesn't work, do a free writing exercise for a couple of minutes. Use a blank page and just write. Then come back to the piece you were trying to start and start. While all of these will take a bit of time, they are productive solutions that mean you will still be able to write and produce something rather than getting increasingly upset with a blank page. Having said that, consistent writing practice and free writing exercises are the best vaccination against the Decepticon strain of writer's blockitis. Time management and working to a clock. The first and most important rule for time management is knowing when to cut your losses. If you're running out of time on a section, be it short answers or an essay, cut your losses and just stop that section and move on to the next. It's always easy to get the first 50% of the marks for a section and hardest to get the last 25%. With that in mind, rather than frittering away time on an essay that could be better used starting your mod C, start your mod C piece. Don't waste moments on a four mark short answer question when there's a seven mark question up for grabs. Now, I bet right about now you're groaning to yourself, more information, time management? Doesn't he see the irony here? When's this bloke gonna shut up? Well, luckily for you, I'm almost done. For each of the areas that I've discussed, text and module knowledge, short answer section skills, writing skills, essay skills, mod C skills, and exam skills, I've shared the best tips for study and exam efficiency that Matrix students learn in their classes. The biggest time saver, obviously, is being well prepared, and there's still plenty of time for that. Now, if you want some specific help for trials, check out our English trial prep course. In our trial prep course, students spend six days doing a combination of revision exercises, group tasks, and practice writing. We work through past papers and do a goodly amount of short answer work. The face-to-face -face classes are great fun and have a lovely collegial vibe as students share ideas and offer feedback on one another's work. They're also an excellent opportunity for students to get that detailed feedback on responses they can't get from overworked school teachers or peers who lack the specific expertise. Our face-to-face -face course runs in the July school holidays. Check our website to see which campuses are offering them. You could also take it as an online course with Matrix Plus while you won't get the classroom environment, you'll still receive in-depth videos and detailed feedback on your work. Questions posted on the Q&A board receive responses within one business day and often generate some good community discussion. The face-to-face -face courses have limited space and most often sell out, so make sure you book early to avoid missing out. And so, on that note, I wanna stop wasting your time. Instead, it's time for you to get to work. Sit down, set up your study rhythm, and start setting course for better English marks. I hope you find these tips 
practical and engaging. I know they work. I've seen thousands of students put them into practice over the past decade and I've seen them succeed. Don't forget to check out the links below for all of the resources I've discussed. Bye for now. Thanks for watching and hopefully I'll see you in one of my English classes. Thank you for attending this Matrix HSC Expert webinar. We hope our webinar has left you with the expert knowledge you'll need to study effectively. For more useful HSC content, click the link above to visit the Matrix Education blog and make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. We look forward to seeing you at our next webinar and best of luck for the HSC.